You've got shit. I've got shit. We've all got shit. So let's therapize that shit with your host, me, Joy Gerhard. Please note, I am not a therapist. I cannot and do not diagnose anyone or prescribe anything. This is just me, someone who struggles with mental illness, emotions, and intrusive thoughts, sharing what skills I've used and how I've used them. Also, trigger warning, in this podcast, I talk about sensitive topics including mental illness, suicidal ideation, self-harm, rape, childhood sexual assault, trauma, and more. I also swear here and there, so listener discretion is advised. If you're new to the podcast, some context for you. I've gotten a ton of value out of doing group therapy and watching others process their shit. In group, I can see other people's patterns and behaviors much more clearly because they aren't my patterns and behaviors, but rather they're adjacent to mine. It's such a relief. I want to share this relief with you via this podcast, wherein I practice skills while actually in the thick of shit. Each episode, I typically do an introduction and provide some context. Then I play a recording of me actively dealing with shit. This isn't me talking about psychology or theories. I'm actually in distress, having strong emotions and strong urges. You're going to hear me crying, angry, numb. But my intention is always to move through an emotion, never to stay there. So stick with me and we'll actually come out on the other side by the end of the episode. Alrighty, let's hop to it. Welcome, welcome. We're going to be therapizing some shit today, but we're not going to be doing it alone because today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. And I know I say that for pretty much every episode, but it continues to be true. So today we're having a conversation with my sister, Ruth, or rather Today, which is November 20th, 2022, I'll be playing for you a recording of a conversation that I had with my sister Ruth back on April 19th, 2022. So like seven months ago. We both have a shared experience of the annoyance at therapy skills when they work. (laughs) Like if you've listened to previous episodes of mine, you've heard me do this thing like fucking, I hate, mm, why does this fucking work? I'm so annoyed. That thing. I do that a lot after using a skill all the way through and having it actually make a massive difference. It's a thing. And my sister also has this experience. So we thought it would be fun to have a conversation about it and try and understand why it annoys us so much. Some things to note before we start. Uh, My sister and I reference in passing Uh, several skills, including uh, observe, describe, non-judgment, mindfulness of current thoughts, mindfulness of current emotions, radical acceptance, turning the mind. I think that's all of them. These are all skills from the DBT manual by Marshall Linehan. DBT stands for Dialectic Behavioral Therapy and is my therapy type of choice. I've linked the DBT manual in the description, both in the PDF form and where you can buy a physical hard copy. We don't get into the details of specific skills here, like doing them step by step, because like I said, this is a weird episode that isn't my typical thing of actually doing a skill step by step. Rather, this is my sister and me using uh, the observe and describe skills and also talking about other skills that would be useful in the future. If you want to find episodes where I use the skills that we name, if you go to the website, it's linked in the description, and search on it for any of the skills we name, it will pop up with a list of every episode that mentions those skills. Because for every episode that I post, I include a reference section of which skills I talk about. So if you want to find all of the episodes where I mention observe, that would be how to do it. Uh, A technical note, whenever I'm quoting anyone else's work other than my own, I turn on a bit of reverb so that I sound like I'm in a Dutch burial vault, or more accurately, a Dutch burial vault bathroom. 
And I say this having never been inside a Dutch burial vault, but I assume they have unique acoustics compared to any other nationality's burial vaults. And that is based on no facts whatsoever. Oh, and before I forget, a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters, Andrew, Anne, and Ruth. You guys are superheroes and are 91.7% of the reason that this podcast exists for public consumption. So thank you so very much. Um, But if you, dear listener, would like to support this podcast, the link to my Patreon is in the description. Okay, let's dive into one of the most (laughs) professional introductions to a recorded conversation ever. Past Joy, take, ooh, Past Joy and Past Ruth, take it away. Okay, we can start recording whenever you want to. I mean, we already, I'm already started recording. I figured. Um, Okay, well, how do you want to start it? Um, I don't know. So I I guess we could start talking about our topic. Let's identify the topic. Our topic of conversation is the annoyance that we feel when a skill works. Yeah, that kind of like, like, what is that? Um, Do you want to introduce me? Oh, you want to do that in your intro? Um, I could. Yes. Here. Hi, everybody. (laughs) Everybody. (laughs) Like this is this is an incredibly professional um, outfit we have running here. Everybody, this is my sister, Ruth, who I mention periodically, who's also one of my Patreon supporters. Say hi, Ruth. Hi, Ruth. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. I mean, hi, everybody. (laughs) Splendid. Um, Do you do you want to give people like a I don't know. 30 seconds, like where you are in life currently, what you're looking at, like kind of just orient folks to where you are. Uh, Sure. Well, physically in life, I'm in central Washington and I'm looking over a lake and snow covered mountains and really, really tall evergreens. And we talk about all kinds of stuff, like the things you talk about on your podcast regularly, just in life. So I'm excited to discuss it for everyone to listen to because I love this kind of stuff. I've dealt with PTSD for the last handful of years and also deal with a lot of different mental health issues and intermittent depression and anxiety. And so I've learned a lot from Joy and the use of her skills. And we're just, we're kind of like a pinball machine of teaching each other things and growing together. So excited to, this is a topic we keep coming back to and then Joy, you always tell me, um, we can't talk about it. We have to record it. So <laughs> I'm, we're yes. finally getting to talk about it. <laughs> yes, we are. So Ruth is the one who sounds like she's on her phone because she is. <laughs> and I'm the one who sounds like I'm not on my phone because I'm not. Because I hear we sound alike. So hopefully that helps you keep us separate. <laughs> yes. In fact, that's actually probably a good thing that we're we're doing this not in person. Because if we did it in person, both of our audio qualities would be the same. And that would be a problem. Very good. Yes. Okay. All right. So I'll start with an example for myself. And we'll see how that goes. Basically, my therapist, every time I make an assertion that, like, I know it's a belief that I have, I know it's not fact, but it's a really strong belief that I have running. Um, Like, today was the belief that (sighs) emotions are soft and weak, and, like, feeling Mm. emotions make me soft or weak. And my therapist said, what would your wise mind say about that? (laughs) And I was like, fuck you! I didn't say that. (laughs) I said, you annoy me. You're a menace. Um... And they laughed. Um, But uh, (laughs) yeah, there's something really obnoxious about like, of course, that's the skill to use. And yet I'm really annoyed that they even bring it up. I'm like, shut up. Don't point out really obvious things to me that would actually make my life better. Yeah, it's weird. I have the same experience. (sighs) It's like I'm irritated that it's simple. Like I want it to be hard. Oh my God. Or it feels like. This is the thing I've been wanting to say for weeks, but you won't let me because we weren't recording it. Yes. Um, It feels like we're, like it's almost uh, invalidating of the struggle if the solution was simple. Shut up. That really annoys me. (laughs) (laughs) No, you're totally right. Like it's supposed to, if it. If it's complicated, the solution should also be complicated. If how I'm feeling or my, the problem that I'm struggling with is complicated, then only a complicated solution oh. will work. 
what huh. we, like it makes it feel like the problem we have is is simple if if we think that then the solution being simple makes it feel like the problem is little or insignificant or ugh. that's an uh -huh. interesting point because like that's basically reverse engineering it because i was coming at it from the direction of I know my problem is complicated. Ergo, it must need a complicated solution. And so when somebody comes to me with a simple solution, I'm like, that can't possibly work. And then I'm annoyed that I didn't think of it sooner. Like if it's that obvious, if it's that simple, it should be, oh no, if it's simple, it should be obvious. Yeah, exactly. Like it makes me feel like an idiot. Like how did I not figure this out before? If this was the solution, like here's one of the most annoying simple solution things that pisses me off that I've resisted for forever that I'm finally doing again. And I'm like, ugh, it works. It's a gratitude thing, right? <laughs> it's the gratitude thing. Like how many times have we heard like, oh, you just got to be grateful, practice gratitude, blah, 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 blah. And I like don't want to do it. And I've had gratitude journals in the past and I like pick them up and then I put them back down and then I pick them up again. But then I was listening to Brene Brown and Brene Brown said that everyone she, well, this is a paraphrasing. So, but what I remember was that the people she's interviewed who say their life is joyful all have a gratitude practice. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. So I've picked it back up again. And I'm like shocked. At the end of my day, I sit and I watch the sunset and I think about my day. And it's amazing. Every day, I can't remember what happened today. I have to think really hard. I'm like, what did I do today to look for what was I grateful for? And I'm like, aware that I just go through my days without being present. And it's like at the end of my day, I have to like force myself to remember what I did and then find the things that I was grateful for. And every time it makes me feel better. <laughs> I'm oh. like, it takes me like five minutes, if that. And like, it can't be that simple. If it's that simple, then why didn't I do it sooner? <laughs> ah, okay. So it brings up, it brings up a should, a judgment, right? Yeah, like maybe I have shame about it or like definitely judgment. What do you do? You, can you identify what the judgment is that you should? Well, clearly that you should have done it sooner. Yeah. And what's wrong with me that I don't do this regularly? Like it's so simple. I should be doing it like because I've dropped the gratitude practice. I've done it before and then I dropped it for a long time and now I'm picking it back up again. And I'm like if it's that simple and it takes like four minutes and it makes that big of a difference, why do I ever not do it? Like there's a huge amount of judgment around the inconsistency. Ooh, well then this begs the question, why, why did you stop doing it? I have no idea. Uh, hmm. I mean, it was years ago that I stopped. So I probably just got out of the habit. I was probably traveling or something. That's one thing I notice is I drop a lot of habits when I change environments. Like oh, if yeah. I move or if I travel, things that I'm like regularly doing, I will forget to do. And then once I'm out of the habit again, then I just forget about them until, you know, I run across Brene Brown again. <laughs> 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 and I'm like, dang it, gratitude practice. Okay. God damn it. Yeah, there's definitely, I appreciate what you said that the, if it's simple, why didn't I do it? Why haven't I been doing it all along? I should be doing it all along. And clearly there's a reason why you haven't, right? <sighs> right. Well, yeah, even though if I don't know what it is, there's a reason. And then if I'm judging myself, I don't get curious about the reason. I just beat myself up, which doesn't work. It's the same thing with drawing. Like I get a lot of joy out of doodling. And I, it is amazing how much I don't let myself doodle, even for like a minute and a half. <laughs> like, I just don't. And then when I finally do, I'm like, oh, this is so enjoyable. <laughs> I do this more often. And then I beat myself up for not doing it more often. And then I don't, I never actually get curious of like, why am I not doing this regularly? I just am like, ugh, I should be doing it. And then, I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> that sound you just made is... The problem with the podcast is like, it's mostly the face that you see when I record my, my therapy sessions. I haven't been able to figure out a way to record them just as audio. So I record them as video and then I convert them to audio, which is what I'm doing right now, actually, um, for our podcast. But um, for our, this is what I'm doing right now, actually, for our podcast. That's an example of me like repeating myself because I wasn't clear the first time. And that's what I cut out, incidentally. So I will cut all of this out. 
Um, <laughs> you should leave it. <laughs> yes. <It's fun. laughs> People get the, the full experience of how chaotic it yeah. is. Oh, God. At least every once in a while. <laughs> like, this is what I actually sound like. Um, oh, my gosh. And as a let me interject for just a yes. second. Our other sister and I, we were talking about this morning, how it's so nice when people actually let you into the process because when we all we see is the polished finished thing oh, yeah. it's really easy to compare yourself to that and feel like oh god my process takes forever like one of my favorite artists the other day who does stick figure stuff i watched him actually do he invited people to a live stream and it took him like 45 minutes to draw two stick figures and i was like oh my gosh i feel so much less crazy that my drawing takes forever <laughs> like, i thought you just dashed off a stick figure and it was no big deal so all that to say, I feel like sometimes you should really leave those in because it will make people be like, oh, oh, I could make a podcast. <laughs> totally. <laughs> like, well, <laughs> like that was my uh -huh. experience. Uh, the the My Favorite Murder, which is the podcast that I listen to the most by far, um, they keep mentioning how much um, their sound engineer, Stephen Ray Morris, cleans up for them so they don't sound horrible. And I never believed them until they started doing live shows which they don't, they don't edit as much. They can't because the audience is responding. And so you could tell if they just cut out a chunk. Um, right. And it's like, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> like <laughs> This is how they, how they sound normally. And there's, what's interesting is there's not a huge difference. There's a tiny difference. It's tiny, but to them, I'm sure it feels like a huge difference. And that's probably, that would be people's response to my podcast. I'm guessing. Cause you know what I sound like normally. Do I sound all that different or all that much more polished on my podcast? Not, no, not noticeably. Yeah. Like, yeah, you just, it's interesting because it comes back to expectations, right? Like we have an expectation we should sound polished. And so, <sighs> but we don't. Like we say, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, yeah. But I feel like we've gotten away from that. What were we? <laughs> oh, yes. You and Anne were talking about something today. Oh, oh like, it was about this. It was yes. about people oh, letting us into the process. So we feel like our own creative process is not absurd. Yeah. Like, because all we see usually is like the finished book or the finished podcast or the finished thing. And it's if you're comparing it's if you're comparing your process to someone's finished product, then it can be discouraging. Yes. Um, yeah. But that was all a side note to what we're actually talking about. <laughs> Which, again, I'm saying you should leave it in. It's funny. Um, what were we actually talking about? Oh, why is the simple solution so fucking annoying? Yeah. Uh, well, you were saying, like, how much you stop yourself from, from drawing because, like, drawing is something that gives you a huge amount of joy when you do it, and yet you don't allow yourself to do it. Yeah. Do you know what gets in the way of you allowing yourself to draw? It's usually expectations. Well, there's two things. One is I have had in the past, it's well, it's a lot quieter now. I've given myself the goal now to draw for one minute every day. Ooh. And so far I've been effective for the last like four or five days. I've drawn for like one minute and I just doodle little like smiley faces and different eyes and eyebrows and whatever. I think it's the expectation of that I should be getting better as an as a drawer or that I should be producing something. Oh. Like <laughs> that you should then, be producing a finished product. Yeah, like I couldn't just doodle for fun. And then I also have, a, I've had a very strong belief that like it's a total waste of time and what the heck am I doing? I should be doing something productive or like I've, I can almost hear in my head, what the heck do you think you're doing? This is such a waste of time. And that is, has been what has stopped me in the past, but it doesn't seem to be very loud anymore. And that's delightful but, progress. Hey. Yeah. So I wonder if there's a similar, thank you. First off, let me not Thank you. That is progress. That is encouraging. <laughs> Let me actually take that in. Yeah, you were about to just like blow right past it. Yeah, and I'm having fun. And it doesn't always, I think I also had an expectation of like, oh, I'll set the goal of a minute a day. And then it'll be my way of like sneakily getting myself to draw more. And it hasn't done that. Like I just, I mean, sometimes every once in a while, but often I just draw for like a minute or two. And okay, <laughs> like that's my goal is to draw for a minute a day. And I'm like hitting my goal. But it's reminding me how much I enjoy it. It's getting me like, oh, maybe I want to draw more. But I was going to say, what is the... So I wonder if there's a similar thing going on with, like, simple solutions. Is it that... Do we have, like, a a belief that stops us from wanting to... Well, one of the things I noticed in my therapy session today is 
So I've been going down this rabbit hole, or maybe I should say an ungulate hole, of watching, uh, I think they're called furriers, um, the people who go and, like, reshoe horses and, like, get stones out of hooves for horses and cows. Um, yeah. And the videos are super soothing, and I, I very much enjoy them. And the number of times that a horse or a cow will have gone lame because they have, like, a grain of sand in their hoof. And it's just at the at the right spot that it basically creates this. The hoof will actually like separate from the cow's foot, or there will be an abscess, or there will be like a huge amount of swelling, or or what have you. And it's all over a grain of sand. And I was explaining this to my therapist and being like, I'm annoyed by simple solutions because it's like, oh, this whole thing is salt could be solved by just removing this tiny grain of sand. And my therapist is like. You're relating to these solutions as though they're simple. Are they actually? Say more about that. Well, like the gratitude practice. Yes, you can say it in two words. I just did. Gratitude practice. <laughs> but is it... I get annoyed because I'm like, that's so obvious. That Well, first off, that's so simple. And then there, I collapse simple with obvious. But my follow-up question would then be, is it actually simple or do I just have the thought that it is? Well, I have the thought that it's trite. Ooh, say more about that. Well, I think one of the things that I don't want to step over what you just said, because I thought that was really interesting, but let's come back to religion and gratitude. Great. Um, oh, no. <laughs> religion uh -huh. and gratitude. Great. This will be fun. So... No. Well, okay. So here's the, this, well, they're actually collapsed, those two things. So I grew, we grew up in around Baptists, like the Baptist faith right. and evangelicals in general. And I sometimes see with Christians this like trite, like, you know, all things work together for good and <laughs> like trite response that doesn't feel it feels like a, I don't want to sit with your pain so I'm just going to offer you a really simple solution so that I can like back away and be like Jesus will work it all out or whatever it's like and, slapping somebody with the bible <laughs> yeah exactly and with gratitude like I think that's part of like I there's people that that feel falsely cheery I feel like there's people who are I guess I don't know like the difference between there feels like people, okay, it seems like there's people who have this, like, unearned optimism or this, like, like lack of awareness of the whole breadth of the human experience. I think that's what it feels like. Like, I'm just going to focus on all the positive, and, I, like, it feels like they don't know how to sit with the serious hard stuff, and I think I've been afraid of letting myself really feel joy or gratitude or because I don't want to be that. I don't want to be someone around whom people feel like, Oh, God, she's just always so happy. It's annoying. Well, because it can be it can be invalidating, right? Like you're you're slapping somebody with gratitude. You're slapping them with optimism. It's like, hey, stop feeling sad. Feel this other way. Have you, you know, ha. like I took something over. Please hold I was trying to grab a book and then I knocked a bunch of stuff over. Okay. I have the reason you just heard a bunch of things fall over is because I was trying to grab one of my journals from the psych ward when my roommate um I wrote down a lot of things that they said because they were brilliant. We were talking because they also grew up um evangelical about the phrase, have you prayed about it? And mm. they, they said this about it. It absolves people of relating. Right. And that that idea comes up a lot in what you were just describing, this kind of like, hey, be grateful or hey, be, hey, be optimistic or hey, focus on the positive feels like an, it absolves people of actually connecting because they, they don't want to have to like be with my sadness or my anger or whatever. They're just slapping me with optimism. <laughs> right. Well, I wonder if that's why, is that the response that we're having? Is it that we've had a lifetime of people really not hearing our story and then giving us trite solutions? And so oh. any tr solution that feels simple feels like that, even if it's actually the accurate solution. 
Okay, hang on. Don't say anything. I need to sit with that for a second. It feels like more of the same is basically what you're saying, that we have had that experience so often of a simple trite solution being offered that now anything that's simple feels trite. <laughs> well, and what's interesting is a lot of them are some of the same solutions we were offered as a child. Not like we well, pray about it, but like kind of like even for me, like a lot of the solution is like. I read some quote the other day that said something like the solution to any problem you have, if you just ask it and get still and quiet and listen, the answer will come to you. And I was like, actually, I'm annoyed that that's probably accurate. It's like, shut the up. Amount of time, <laughs> the amount of time I don't listen to myself, because when I was a kid, it was like, you know, God will have the answer. God will do blah, blah, blah. like there's but there is some I no longer consider myself religious, but I do consider myself spiritual and I do consider myself spiritual and there is like there's this wisdom and a connection to something bigger than me that I've experienced that I wouldn't call religion or yeah do you know what I'm saying like I think that I think this is maybe what I what, that there was kernels of truth in the trite solutions we were given as kids but the packaging and how they were delivered and the method and the context and the lack of listening and all of it oh god the lack of listening <sighs> made us want to throw out the entire solution right and if anything we're hearing now is similar to the solutions we heard as kids, like, just be grateful. I mean, because that was one of the things, right? Yes. Like, Stop gratitude was one. Yep. Yeah. Ugh. Oh, well, it's the do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your request to God in the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. <laughs> that one sticks. Well, I think of um, we were talking yesterday. Um, I mentioned this uh, tweet from our our favorite social media therapist, Whitney Goodman. She's a sit with wit. Mm, Toxic, she's great. She is. She's delightful. Um, Toxic positivity is offering someone a very simple solution for a very complicated problem that you know nothing about. And you're right. I think because sometimes the the solution is in fact simple, but. I think the problem is the you know nothing about. <laughs> like it's somebody else coming in and not actually getting your full experience. Right. Before offering that simple solution. <laughs> I mean, like. Are we doing the same thing to ourselves? Sorry, go ahead. Well, I think of um, hold that, like put a pin in that question because I think that's a great question. Um, like even a, a wrong clock or a, a, a broken clock is right twice a day kind of phenomenon. Like if I go to a mechanic and the mechanic to every car says, oh, you need an oil change. A significant amount of the time, he'll actually be right. Right? Like a lot of cars do need right. oil changes. But my trust in that that is the solution is significantly lower because if, if the mechanic hasn't even popped the hood or run any diagnostics or anything, how much am I going to trust their suggestion? Right. So if we were grew, grew up with people who didn't actually listen to us, didn't really understand our experience, and then just offered us trite or what felt like trite religious wisdom, I don't yeah. know. Like, it's more about that we weren't listened to. Yeah. And that, it, the solution then felt like it couldn't possibly be the right one because you didn't actually, you don't understand what the problem actually is. Yeah. It's kind of like a one size fits all thing. I mean, like, there's a broad understanding that like physical activity of any kind is really helpful for depression, right? Oh, um, I hate that. I know, right? It's annoying. <laughs> um, the same thing again. Okay, go ahead. And like, if somebody comes to me and says, "Hey, I'm not feeling so great," and I go, "Well, have you gone for a walk?" Like, I'm right. I'm thinking of my first DBT therapist who said, "You're not allowed to offer advice until you've demonstrated you understand the full scope of the problem. It's the demonstrating it of like actually hearing your experience. What do you feel depressed about? Like, what is your life like? And then saying, "Hey, I know this is going to sound really simple, but I think it's exactly it's something that would actually really, really help because here's why exercise or any sort of physical movement is like supportive 
or of not supportive. It doesn't support the depression. It alleviates it. I don't know what it does. It helps. <laughs> and me offering that suggestion and being just like, here, put this on. It'll fit you. Doesn't really demonstrate that I get your experience. Right. Which kind of implies that we have a really strong need of being heard and understood. And that if that's not being met, we're not going to listen to other solutions. Like that that need is... That need supersedes the solution. Because if if our chief need was for a solution, then somebody saying, hey, try a gratitude practice, I'd be like, great, thank you. I'll go do that. Because to, I mean, like a gratitude practice and going for a walk, <laughs> like those feel like just no matter the circumstance, those things would be useful. And the need for understanding and validation and being heard is more important than that solution. Ugh. <laughs> okay, what thought did you just have? Well, just how I'm just aware of how my how often I want to offer solutions to people and how if the real need is not actually to whatever they're telling me about, but it's to be heard and understood, then I'm just like offering exactly the wrong thing or not the wrong thing, but the not effective to what the need actually is thing. So <laughs> yes, um, there was something you said earlier that had me go, oh, Ruth, we have some... We have some like unhealed something there um, between you and me. I don't think it's actually unhealed. I think um, we've actually healed a lot of the fixing, uh, my experience of your fixing. I think there, we stumbled upon a, a description or a characteristic I hadn't put together before that- Which was what? Well, just that like, you can come to me with the perfect solution and- if I don't feel like you've heard me first, my willingness or openness to hear your solution is virtually zero. Hmm. Well, I like that what your, was it your therapist that said you have to demonstrate that you've yes. heard? Yes. It's because not, I often yeah. have heard, I just, you don't know that I've heard. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Because I, if I haven't heard, then I wouldn't know that this is a potential solution. Yep. Like... Unless I'm doing the mechanic thing where I'm like, gratitude fixes everything. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, uh, For those of you who don't know, which is most listeners, um, Joy and I have a long history of me trying to fix things for her. <laughs> and uh, it just really didn't work. Like I default, my default setting for most of my life has been, you have a problem, let me offer you a solution. And... That really, 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 really didn't work, especially, I mean, I don't think it works for anyone I'm learning, but um, super didn't work for Joy. Yeah, so that's the thing that I still catch myself doing every once in a while, but I've gotten loads better. Well, and it's not offering fixes. Well, and I think it's, it's like the, the what dad always says that uh, around the gender binaries that men want to fix and women want to be heard. And I keep going back to maybe the problem is not being heard. <laughs> like, maybe that's actually the thing that needs fixing. Um, mm. And that that whatever I'm talking about, whatever the quote unquote problem that is the, the more surface level thing that I'm venting to you about is just the the flavor of the month for my not feeling heard. Interesting. Yeah. So if that's the thing, which my lots of experience with lots of different people, including you, validates that, that that's a really core need that we need to be heard and understood. Mm -hmm. So trite solutions, because the problem, it's like we're not clear on what our problem actually is when we come to talk about a problem, or like we're not aware that there's multiple layers. I don't always have the self-awareness to come to you and say, I have this surface problem that I'm dealing with right now, like how to change my oil. But really, also, I just want to be heard for my frustration and that I've been trying to learn this for the last three months and I just need someone to get that I'm frustrated. So if you could just get that first and then tell me how to change my oil, that would be really <laughs> great. Like, yeah. we don't do that. No. I mean, sometimes you do this with me sometimes, which is extremely helpful. When I call, you say, what do you need right now? Would you like me to just listen? Would you like me to validate you? Would you like a solution? And pretty much every single time I say, I want you to listen and then validate me. And then maybe I'll be open to a solution. Oh, yeah. Like I can count on one finger <laughs> the number of times I've asked you, what do you need right now? And if I give <laughs> you a, a, a selection that you've chosen solution 
instead of like, it's so, it's so infrequent. Like the chief need is always validation first. And I know when, when you or anyone else has asked me those, that question, I always feel guilty about saying I need validation. Interesting. Like I have the very strong belief that I should be teachable, which means that I should be open to hearing your solution first. And that me saying, I just want you to, to validate or I want you to listen and then validate is feels to me like I have the thought that that is me being unteachable. I don't know where I could have gotten that messaging from. Oh, strange. That's sarcasm. Well, you know that. I don't know if our listeners know that. Isn't that interesting, though? Because if the way you learn is first I need to be validated and then I can hear the solution, then you being teachable would actually be saying I need validation first. <laughs> right. Yes. Oftentimes I never get to the solution. Like I had a bunch of thoughts when, when our conversation yesterday and like just high level summary for the listeners, um, you had called and you were having a trauma response to a thing. And as we were talking, I had a bunch of observations and a bunch of things like, have you tried this, this and whatever that I never ended up saying because what you needed, what you said you needed first was being heard and validated. Which isn't to say that I didn't offer nothing. Like I did offer a couple things towards the end there, but like the the gross tonnage of what I had, I didn't end up bringing up. Well, that's the interesting thing. Like I, I think I have a, a view that my sense of value comes from being able to offer a solution. <laughs> oh, lovely. Yes. Because it feels threatening to me. Like here's a truth that I'm very aware of that annoys the crap out of me, which is that Everyone has their own solution inside of themselves if they just have the space to like hear it. And I've seen it. Like when I listen to people and just ask questions and reflect back what I'm hearing, they always come to their own solution. Like almost always. And sometimes I'll have something to say, like something will pop into my head where I'm like, it doesn't feel like it comes from me often. It's like, oh, but it's often kind of almost more of a reflection. Like, oh, interesting. I hear you saying blah, 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 blah. I wonder about, and then, but like the solutions that stick, I think come from us. Right. And so I have thought for a while, well, then that means that what's the point of me? <laughs> yes, like, you're out of a job. Don't you mean yeah, extinct? Exactly. Don't you mean extinct? <laughs> um, exactly. But if what people really, really need is to be heard, then we're never out of a job. Like then the thing that I have to give someone is to listen and to reflect. And Yes. Yeah. But I can still feel I have some, like it's gotten a lot better and I'm, it's actually when I, when I embrace that, which I have in moments, it actually feels very freeing. Like, wow, I don't have to have anything brilliantly wise to say. Like, I can just listen and reflect and ask questions and they'll get to what they need to get to on their own. Mm. Huh. Yeah, it takes all the pressure off of you having to have like the brilliant thought or the brilliant observation that makes a difference. Or you taking my advice if I do offer actually offer a solution. Right. Yep. I want to come back to something I said earlier. Oh, great. Which was... We were saying how uh, what feels annoying about the simple solutions is that the we don't feel heard. They're offered before we um, feel really heard and understood. Yes. And I was wondering if we're doing that to ourselves. Ugh. Okay, fine. Hang on. Okay, I'm annoyed. Um, this actually happened in therapy. And this is, I think it's the first time my therapist has seen me do it. But you have pointed this out or been witness to it or something, that I use non-judgment as a way to invalidate myself. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Specifically, non-judgment of other people. When somebody else has hurt me, I will use non-judgment of them to suppress how I feel about being hurt. Yes. And my therapist... Ugh, I think I do that too. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. 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 And that is exactly what you just described, is that we're... We're doing it to ourselves. We are offering a solution before we've been fully heard. I am applying non-judgment before I've had a chance to express all my emotions and all my thoughts. And I mean, I can I can express thoughts that I have that are judgmental and still need, be non-judgmental. Like I can say, I'm having the thought that they're an idiot <laughs> um, and be like, yes, that right. is a thought I'm having as distinct from that person's an idiot. <laughs> um, right. So like mindfulness of current thoughts and mindfulness of my emotion, 
I, I use non-judgment to suppress both of those skills. To be like, you're not supposed to think those thoughts. You're supposed to be non-judgmental joy, um, which means I'm suppressing myself and I never feel fully heard. And it doesn't work. It's like it's like trying to use a hammer to unscrew something. It's it's a great tool, just not for that. Well, I wonder, because that's what was happening yesterday. Well, I don't know. Like, because I've been feeling kind of off. Like, something's, I can tell something's trying to come up emotionally. And I don't actually think I'm feeling that way today. But I was feeling that way yesterday. Like, I woke up feeling off. And I journaled a little bit, and I had a little bit of a sense, but I couldn't really. And... You know, but journaling is what I'm supposed to do to figure it out. <laughs> and I didn't <laughs> figure it out. And then I finally talked to you. And then you just, it, like, often it comes out in conversation with other people. Sure. Um, and I don't know. I'm just wondering if that's part of why I've been feeling, because I'm doing the right things, right? Like, I'm doing my gratitude practice and getting enough sleep. And, like, I mean, I'm not doing all the right things. I'm eating a lot of sugar. Something I'm noticing, though, Ruth, is... You're going to hate me. I'm sorry. It's okay. That you're using all of that as an avoidance. Like, I think that's that, what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. Never mind. You won't hate me. You already Yeah, to totally. That, that's what I'm saying is that's what I think we're doing to ourselves. We're using the solution to avoid actually hearing ourselves and actually hearing and feeling the experience that we're having. Yeah. And I wonder if that's part of why we're so irritated with the solution because uh, when it works, we still are not feeling heard. I don't know. That's my. That sounded like it resonated for you. Well, I mean, like, I'm irritated with the the solution. Like, when my therapist offered um, what they offered earlier, like, what would your wise mind say about that? And I'm like, shut up! <laughs> you don't know me! Actually, they do. <laughs> and that's, an it's annoying. And when you offer something, after we've had a, a lengthy conversation, you're like, well, have you thought about, you know, using this skill? <laughs> and I, seriously, I'm like, you're a menace! fuck off. Um, it's because now it's being offered from a place of somebody who actually does hear me. And there's some annoyance of like, oh, but this is what everybody's been saying. And I didn't have access to using it before because it was being delivered by somebody who didn't know me. It was it was the mechanic slapping me with an oil change, you know, and I'm mixing just got so many metaphors. But um, there's some frustration when it comes from somebody who who has actually demonstrated that they understand me. They're like, you actually really need an oil change. And I'm like, fuck, that's what that other person was saying. And if I had been able to hear it then, seven years ago, 20 years ago, like how different would my life be? Now I can finally hear it because it's finally being delivered by somebody who's actually like demonstrated, oh, we've looked under your hood and we've run all the diagnostics and we've looked at these things and you absolutely need an oil change. And here's how that's going to impact your car and all of this other shit. So there's judgment that you didn't accept the solution earlier. Well, there's, I think, I think part of it's grief, actually. It's not. Mm. I don't know that I have the judgment of myself or even of the other person so much as it's just like. God, this could have gone differently. I wish it had gone differently. Right. And kind of like I've mentioned this quote on the podcast before of um, in the movie Spotlight, where they realized they could have published the story like 10 years before because they had all the information. And the, the editor in chief of the newspaper says, you know, we spend all this time stumbling around in the dark. When we finally turn the light on, there's all this blame to go around because now we can suddenly see. And I think there's like, I struggled this much for this long and the light switch was right fucking there yet yeah, th it very much feels like like being in a dark room like a, a pitch black room and trying to find the exit and i start by going left and if only i had gone right if only the door was like one inch to my right but i went left and so it took me 75 hours to go around the entire width of the room or length of the, the entire diameter of the room um, before I finally found the door, which was one inch away from where I started. And what is that grief? A judgment of like, what a waste. Um, am I? It's a lot of expectation. Yeah. Like where did our, I mean, we've been talking about this a lot with kids. Like it takes a kid as long as it takes a kid to learn how to walk. It just takes as long as it takes. And Every kid is different, and some kids learn months before other kids do. And and the kids I don't have any judgment some... around how long it's taking them. 
Yeah, and a lot of adults don't either. Some adults do. Like, there's some parents who have high expectations, but a lot of adults don't. Like, they just, with that young of an age, like, there's just a, well, it takes you as long as it takes to learn how to. So there's something, like, when we grow up, like, we now think we should be, I don't know, like, okay, so it takes us as long as it takes to learn that gratitude actually does make a difference. (laughs) And... Well, I think here's what I hypothesize as being kind of an underlying part of the if only is a kid learning to walk. You know, let's say the kid finally takes their first steps and now they're toddling around and they're not then thinking, oh, all of the things I've missed for the last, what, year and a half that I could have been experiencing if I had been able to walk from birth. You know, they don't have that. The men- I'm assuming. I actually don't know. They could be thinking that and they don't have language yet. <laughs> right. But yeah, there's not this like, here's all the things I missed out on because I didn't know how to walk for the last year and a half. There's not a comparison of like, hey, this other person who's the exact same age as me, as I, they're walking. Why can't I walk? Like there's just none of those, none of those processes going on. Right. Yeah, which we do a lot. It's a comparison. Yeah, and if not to um, other people, then certainly to myself. Like, if only I'd learned to do a gratitude practice 20 years ago. Right. There was something you said earlier that I wanted to circle back to. The Yeah, I don't know. It sounds like also like a lack of grace with ourselves or understanding or compassion or because if we weren't comparing. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I I was about to agree with you um, that there's an assumption of what the process is supposed to look like or should look like and not an acceptance like this is part of the process. Right. Yeah. And there's also like an end something or other like Uh, we're trying to get somewhere. Yeah. Like that, that sense of, oh, if only, really only shows up when I have a destination or uh, an expectation or something in mind of what I'm trying to achieve. Because it's, if only I'd done that, I would have gotten out of this room faster. If only this, then this other thing would have happened. And that other thing is a desirable thing. It's a thing that I want. Right. Whereas like if our goal... And life was to like be compassionate with ourselves or present in this moment or something like that. Shut up. Then... <laughs> yeah, that compassion is the goal, not a an adjective to describe something else. It's the point. Right. Because then wherever you are is fine. Like could take you 35 years to learn how to ride a bike no problem are you enjoying the moment are you present in every moment that you're learning how to ride cool yeah or learning let's make it more personal learning how to draw yes <laughs> like <laughs> okay it took you 30 years to figure out shading cool did you have fun were you compassionate with yourself were you present yeah okay so what i'm hearing and i'm annoyed is A lot of the judgment comes from not meeting a goal that is a destination and that perhaps the more effective thing to do is to have the the goal be a way of being rather than a destination or an accomplishment, you know? Right. More like an experience you want to have. Like, I want to experience being joyful in life or... Yeah. That annoys me. Why does that annoy you? Um, well, part of it is that it becomes apparent that I don't know myself very well. If I stick to external goals that are dictated by society, like, you know, having your own house by the age of 40 or having a job that looks a certain way or whatever, I don't have to even be present with myself in order to accomplish those things. I don't Mm -hmm. have to check in. Is is this actually what I want or anything else? It's all prescribed externally. Whereas if Mm -hmm. you say, Joy, like the greatest goal, the the highest goal 
um, is self-compassion or self-validation or whatever you know, resonates for you. Yeah. Then the only way I can know if I'm achieving that is to be present with myself, to actually know myself, to check in with myself. I don't like that. Because that's not a skill you have very well yet. Yeah, and it's uh, it's harder to to fake, I guess. Like, there is no way to fake that. Right. The only way to do it is mm. to do it. I can't be dissociated and do it. Right. There's no going through the motions for that. Yes. And I actually want to play you... Um, a TikTok that I saw recently that <sighs> pissed me off a lot. Hang on. Can we, while we're paused for sure. a moment? Yes. I have to pee real bad. Okay, great. All right, I'm putting my headset down. I'm walking inside to go pee. I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh, no. What? I had a realization while I was peeing. Oh, lay it on me. The whole, like, we're not feeling heard and... Remember the other day when you, like, okay, so trite solutions. Yes. Are not always the right solutions. Like you said, walking is almost always going to be helpful, but not if you have a broken foot. Yes. Yep. So remember like a week ago when you went, kept going to the gym? Mm -hmm. Because that's what you do. You go to the gym. It makes you feel better. Uh-huh. But your body was actually asking for something else. Uh-huh. And so I feel like the listening to ourselves uh, is more the thing than actually the solution. And then picking from the potpourri of potential solutions based on how we're actually doing. Right. That's annoying. I'm annoyed. Okay. Meh. <laughs> Very good. I found the TikTok, by the way. Cool. Um, Did you figure out how to play it? No, I'm, but it has captions, so I'm just going to read them to you. Okay. When you're healing, you can actually lose motivation. There's something called trauma drive. And when your body is stuck in fight or flight, you can override the limits of your body. You can be very productive and get a lot of things done in a short period of time. And as you heal and your body comes out of the fight or flight response... You lose that ability to override the limits of your body because you're no longer in survival. You might feel oh. like you're struggling with motivation, but it's because you're learning how to motivate yourself from within and not from a trauma drive survival. Holy yeah. crap. Yep. Well, it makes so much sense because if you're running from a tiger, it's very important that your body keep running even if you're exhausted. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's the whole point of adrenaline, right? Right. <laughs> well, I was thinking... <sighs> So I am going to the gym pretty much every day and, um, and or doing this, no, not and, or doing the stairs. And I was thinking the other day that back in like 2014 and 2015, I used to go to the gym every day to lift. And then on the weekends, I would go and do a hot yoga class at like nine in the morning and then go run the stairs, which for our listeners is... I do the stairs 10 times and it's the Empire State Building. That's It's that amount of height. And I run them. And then I would go and paddle my paddleboard across the Puget Sound and back. Which is not a small lake. No. It's, it is a huge body of water. It's two miles each way, I think. And I would do that every Saturday and Sunday. And I was like massively fit. And I was judging myself at the gym the other day. I'm like... Why am I so tired? Um, but that period of time, 2014 um, and 2015, was when I was having PTSD symptoms, but not hadn't gotten help yet, <laughs> hadn't started going to therapy yet. And even then, basically, like I crashed um, right around the time I started doing exposure for my initial like adult rape trauma. And I have not been able to get back to that same level of physical activity that I had before I started doing exposure. Wow. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But like what I'm noticing <gasps> then, oh, you just had a realization. Go ahead. Don't lose your thought. I won't. So, well, I'm just, I'm noticing because if, if then that sets an expectation, like I should be able to be 
productive all day and then yep. I push it and then I crash. What I'm actually noticing, like, so one of the most productive weeks I had was when I was staying with mom and dad in July when I was in between places and I had to go through everything I owned and figure out what would I, was I packing? What was I taking with me? What was I leaving behind? And I had a week to do it because I had to be somewhere to dog sit. And I was like worried I wasn't going to get it all done. And I also wanted to spend time with mom and dad and I had a couple friends in town I wanted to see. And so what I noticed was I was actually paying extremely good attention to what my body wanted. And when it was tired, I would rest and I would go in the backyard and I would lay down in the sun and I would think I'm probably about to take a two hour nap. And then 15 minutes later, I would feel energized again. And then I would go back to work. And I worked, like, I did so much in a week. And I would often work until, like, 10 o'clock at night. But I was pacing myself. And I was letting myself stop when I was tired and not having this expectation I should just be able to go, 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 go. And I notice now I, I slip into that easily of, like, well, I shouldn't be tired yet. I've only been doing something for two hours. But if I actually let myself stop for like 20 minutes, then I can go again. Yeah. And I think like, I noticed that with myself that I don't want to take breaks because then I'll lose momentum. Like it'll take me that much longer to like get back up to that same speed. Of course, that's the case when I'm operating from survival. I, you do actually lose momentum. Like your, your endorphins, not endorphins, your adrenaline decreases. Right. Because you're like, oh, we're fine now. And it actually is harder to get going again. Because that was that was the thing that was my driving whatever source. But when you're not functioning for adrenaline. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it makes sense too. Like, Because I, I keep thinking like that's a very puritanical perspective of just you, you do it even when it sucks. But then I think like the Puritans were absolutely in survival mode like all the time. <laughs> right like they were scared of witches and there was a war going on and they were afraid of like dying from disease or starvation or what have you like that that work ethic was necessary because of being in survival mode right and it was enabled by being in survival mode yes yes it was possible because of that yeah that's very interesting. I never heard of that before. Trauma drive. Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of eye opening for me. It explained at least like why I feel really lazy right now. <laughs> like I have that thought that I'm being fucking lazy, and that even little things, like the only thing I have scheduled on Tuesday is my therapy, and then I have my organizing day on Wednesday. At- so I spend all day over there, and then I have DBT group on Thursday, and that feels like a full week to me. I'm like, oh wow, I really need like a week off now. And then I have a a four day weekend of doing nothing to recover. Clearly there's, there's processing going on and there's a lot of stuff going on that I no longer have the trauma drive to support. So I just need a lot of downtime and I have the thought that I'm being lazy. Yeah, no, I get it. Often when I've processed a lot emotionally, I'll sleep for like 12 to 13 hours. Yeah, which makes sense, right? Because we know that all of it lives in our body. Hmm. Well, where did we get to in this conversation? Where did we, what were our takeaways? Well, certainly that a lot of the annoyance at a solution is the belief that it's simple. The belief that, (gasps) yes, go ahead. That was the thing I wanted to come back to. Splendid, tell me. Well, you said you posed the question earlier of your your therapist posed the question of is the solution actually simple? Uh-huh. And that was one of the things I wanted to say about gratitude is it it actually like the way, what I understand about our brain is our brain is hardwired for almost for negativity. Like it's looking for threats. Threats. Exactly. So to actually have your brain focus on not threats like on things to be grateful for is actually harder than to let your brain focus on the threats. Right. Yes. So Just, while sitting and writing down three things that I'm grateful for is a simple looking solution, <laughs> I have to override a lot of my natural brain's way of functioning in order to do that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's that I think that the solution sounds short. Gratitude practice is two words. And that, like what you just said, it looks simple. Like you 
sitting down and writing th- essentially three sentences every day. Like what is, what is complicated about that? But you're rewiring your brain, literally. Like you're basically brainwashing yourself into paying more attention to the positives. Right. And it's not simple. So like, while it sounds simple, looks simple, smells simple, <laughs> um, it's not actually simple. Like, yeah. And once it becomes a habit, then it becomes a lot simpler. But to develop the habit, and maybe that's part of where it can be, feels like simple. Because someone who has it as a habit, it might actually be simple for them. Because it's a habit now. <sighs> that, okay, hang on. Yes. That is part of the invalidation of a lot of these suggestions is that typically by the time it's actually made a difference in someone's life, it's because they've, it has become a habit for them. It has become innate and it it may even occur to them as an easy thing to do, but that's only because they've spent, I don't know, however many months and or years. um, Why do I say that? Months or years, months and years? doesn't matter, Joy, to get to that point. <laughs> and I think that's one of the things that, that I find really super invalidating. I mean, the other day when you called and you needed help with that image, and I, sitting in my car at the gym, basically walked you through how to edit an image in PowerPoint because that's the, the program you had access to. I was, I was having a good day that day. Like I was grounded and, and whatever. Cause my, I think my normal setting is like, when you said you don't know how to use PowerPoint, I'm like, how do you not know how to use, how to use PowerPoint? It's the same as word. <laughs> like it, to me, it feels identical essentially. Like I don't see that there's any real significant difference between the two. And that was not your experience of it. All you saw were the differences, right? Right. Um, So for me to, if I had said, like, why is this hard for you? How would that conversation have gone? (laughs) (laughs) Screw you. Yep. Yeah, it would have been, it would have been much shorter. That's for sure. And I think that is one of the, one of the challenges in being like the person who's making the offer of a, of a suggestion is that oftentimes it comes from a place of, if not mastery, at least like proficiency. And they make it look easy. Somebody who's good at a thing, who does it routinely, will make it look easy. Yep. So maybe that's why we think the solutions are simple when maybe they're not actually. Running is simple, but not if you're eight months old. No. I remember that exercise, I think we did it, of um, like write down all the instructions on how to wrap a present or do a thing. And the amount of assumptions we make about other people's knowledge and skill level Like if I told you how to run, I would say to you, okay, lean forward and kind of hop from one foot to the next and then do it fast, I guess. I don't have to teach you how to walk first. (laughs) But if I were to teach an eight-month-old how to run, I would first have to explain how to stand up and then how to walk and then how to run. And you could tell them all of those things, but they don't actually... They can't do them until they experience it. Your body learns by doing. Right. So you saying the words to them doesn't give them the experience. And then they have to actually try it and then fall over and realize, oh, I contracted that muscle a little too hard. I got to do it a little less next time. Yeah. And there's also readiness. Like an eighth month old, and I actually don't know that much about child development, but like I'm assuming that there are like... There are neurological pathways that haven't been formed yet. There are neuromuscular junctions that haven't been formed yet. Like they may not actually have that skill yet. And they may not even be capable of having that skill yet. Right. Their body's literally not developed well enough. Yes. For them to actually learn how to walk. Yeah. So readiness. What, readiness. Yep. So getting back to our kind of our summary of what we got from this is that when somebody offers a solution that has a few amount of words, (laughs) um, (laughs) we have the thought that it's simple and that given that it's simple, we should have known it already and or used it already, been doing it this whole time. Like there's judgments around not having done it sooner. Yes. It also triggers memories of people offering solutions who have not demonstrated that they understand our experiences. So even when it's not invalidating, it feels invalidating. Like even when you've demonstrated to me, you understand where I'm coming from, and then you offer me a simple solution, 
quote unquote simple, I will still have a flashback to being slapped with gratitude, right? Right. So there's unhealed um, wounds from previous invalidation. And that we're doing it to ourselves as well. That was going to be my that, next point. Yes. <laughs> yep. That when we say, these are the things we're supposed to do when we're not feeling well, we're supposed to go to the gym and we're supposed to write in our gratitude journal. And we do them always, even if our body is like, please, can we just sit in a bathtub today? Uh-huh. And like, if somebody offers me a solution, I will then gaslight myself into being like, you're supposed to be teachable, Joy. Like, you're not supposed to feel invalidated by this. You're supposed to take their suggestion. So like, I don't even check in with myself about what I'm needing in that moment. I need validation. And then I'm invalidating myself around needing validation. It's a double whammy. It is. It's a va invalidation sandwich. On invalidation bread. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just through and through. Like a, a corn dog where the breading is invalidation and the dog is invalidation. <laughs> exactly. Dipped in invalidation cheese sauce. Splendid. And then uh, there's invalidation condiments as well. Exactly. Yep. So what I'm hearing is that the, the annoyance of like, fuck you, <laughs> like... You're not possibly telling me it's that simple it comes from judgments around how I think it should be and self-invalidation, chiefly, it sounds like. Yeah. Well, yeah, judgments around where it should be kind of sums up the how I should have been, how it, yeah, an expectation of how it should have looked comparison. Right. So I'm asking myself now, like, what, what to do, what would be more effective the next time somebody, like the next time you go, or <laughs> next time my therapist says, what would your wise mind say about this joy? I think to be aware of, I'm feeling angry now, or I'm feeling annoyed now. Um, I'm having judgment thoughts now. I'm feeling grief, I think, over how, how it should have, how it could have gone, how I wish it had gone. I think the first step then it, it really is to just be to observe what comes up in those moments because I just jumped to I'm annoyed and never really get curious. Right. But yeah. To observe. And then I can't tell you what the second step is because it will be based on what I observe. <laughs> hundred percent. Yeah. It seems like it keeps coming back to listening to ourselves ah. and checking in. Which is ironic because this week in my DBT group, like our entire thing, every module starts with mindfulness again. And this is, the, I think, the first time anybody has asked this question in DBT group is we're doing it, um, observe and describe. And my skills group leader said, what other skills are there that require observe? And I'm like, fuck, almost every one. Like acceptance, the first thing is to observe. Uh, turning the mind, the first step is to observe. Like practicing mindfulness of thoughts, practicing mindfulness of emotions, all of these, like literally the first step is observe. It's funny because I don't want to, I'm like noticing resistance to observing. I think it's because, I don't know, like I, maybe it's a capitalistic, I shouldn't slow down or I need to keep producing or yeah. like, but I'm thinking about this documentary I watched once about a farm and they were having issues with snails. Like the snails, this is wild, I've never seen this before, but the snails were eating their fruit trees and there were like thousands of them probably and they were like covering the trunks and and they had no idea what to do and they were really determined to be working with nature rather than against so they didn't want to like spray pesticides sure, or yeah. and that one day the farmer noticed that his dog spends a lot of time just sitting and watching and just like sits outside and just watches things <laughs> and he was like huh, maybe I should just sit and watch. So he just like sat and just started watching his farm. And then eventually one of the things he noticed was that ducks eat snails. <laughs> and so they had a bunch of ducks and they moved the ducks into the orchard and they ate all the snails. Neat. Yeah, but so, it was like him slowing down and just watching the pattern of what was happening. Right, so like- On his farm. He wasn't like ahead, bringing sorry. in another a predator or anything. It's like, my ducks are already here. We're just going to kind of corral them into the right spot. Yeah. And I, I noticed a resistance to it too. Like, I don't want to say it's always trauma drive because I think this is, even for people who haven't experienced trauma, I think this is a, very much a capitalistic thing of like, just keep going, just keep going. Don't pay attention to the pain. I mean, I certainly noticed this like when I hike, I will almost always develop blisters no matter how much 
tape I use and amazing socks and everything else. And I really don't, I don't want to be mindful of it. I almost, I like purposefully, I'm like, don't pay attention to it. Don't focus on it. Focus on something else. Interesting. And there's certainly time for that, right? Like there's, there's absolutely time when there is literally nothing to be done. There's no solution to be found. And it is, it is okay to not put an entire, like all of your mental energy onto the thing that's causing a problem. But I feel like that's the exception rather than the rule. Yes, exactly. Well, I'm noticing it right now, literally, my ankle has been bugging me like a lot in the last three hours. Like actually, no, a little earlier than that, I was out in the field doing stuff and my ankle started bugging me and I've been ignoring it and I'm about to go plant a bunch of trees and I'm like, oh no, I wonder why my ankle's bothering me. Like what is going on? Well, it's funny because you say the thing about blisters and I just watched a video the other day about walking and our feet and blisters and stuff and the guy said that there's a myth that like if I just, you just need to toughen up your feet and just power through the blisters and he was like, blisters happen because you have a force like you're sliding. Mm -hmm. There's friction. There's friction and there doesn't have to be. So like a well-fitting shoe or like the right, like, you know, blisters are not a natural expression of doing something outside in shoes. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> like, huh. So, but if you're, if you're ignoring them and you're just powering through, then you would never get curious of like, well, how does, how does one avoid getting blisters mm -hmm. rather than it's like, well, now I have them and I just have to keep punishing. And same thing with my ankle. Like, what is going on? I don't know what's going on. And if I power through, then I'm probably just going to hurt myself more than if I get curious of like, why is my ankle bothering me? Was there something I was doing earlier? But I, I absolutely hear you. Like, there's there's kind of this mechanical, like, be a robot, just keep going. It doesn't matter that you're in pain mentality, which again, keep thinking of the Puritans. They should not be our gold standard. Like there are times when you actually, you, you do, you keep going when you're being chased by a tiger. If you get a splinter in your foot, you keep going anyway. Like you're not going to stop and pull the splinter out. You know, you might have a stitch in your side and you might feel like you're going to puke. You don't sit and rest. You keep running. But I think the problem is that narrative is, has, is the stronger narrative in our society. And I think that narrative is the exception in life. But yeah. it's the narrative. So I think the like even right now, it's interesting that you feel the need to say that there are exceptions to the rule. Like, yeah, we know. <laughs> yeah. Like, we already know that. We need to. It's the other story that narrative is too. But I hear what you're saying. Cause it's a, like, well, I want to validate that that is indeed actually the solution sometimes. But that's the narrative that's really strong that we need to. It's the other narrative that it's actually good mostly rest. good to slow down and rest and listen to your body because yeah. it's trying to communicate something to you that's important. And if you power through, you're actually going to run out of oil in your engine and then do really, really a lot of damage. Well, it reminds me of, well, so first off, like it's taking a trauma response and applying it everywhere, which is what we know we do with PTSD. It's like, oh, if, if all I have is a hammer, everything's a nail. But the other thing I notice is like all of these these movies of like tremendous perseverance, like kind of these these stories of like, the really inspirational stories are of this behavior, are of pushing through the pain and never giving up and never stopping and giving up friendships and giving up all these other things and focusing on this singular goal. And I have always like I hate I hate inspirational movies so much. Most of most of the stories that people find inspirational, I get really depressed by. Um, and I think that's there's some little tiny part of me that even when like my trauma drive is suppressing everything else goes, we know this isn't healthy and it's not sustainable and we really shouldn't be like applauding this behavior and saying that everybody should aspire to this because really what we're saying is don't be a well-rounded human who cares about your own health like all of this stuff like it's not great messaging but it's what we like we see our heroes that's what we see as heroic is that behavior right it's not the people who are like I worked hard for a year and then I got really tired and I took six months off and I went to Europe and I sat in a chalet for six months. And then at the end of that, I was like, I could do a little more work. And then I did a little more work. And 35 years later, I finally published a book. <laughs> right. Yes. It's the person who gave up every single other aspect of their life and wrote a novel in a month. Right. They're the people who get the, the accolades and it's like, oh, look, strive for this. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Indeed. So what did you get out of all of this? I mean, I think the main thing is that I'm not listening to myself. That that's the main thing I got is that if I'm irritated by a solution or that it, even that it works, it just it makes me curious. Am I not feeling heard? Is that the thing that's uh, I'm also getting that I'm just not curious when I like you said, like my default response is like, ugh, that's so annoying. And then I'm not curious. Why is that annoying? Mm. So I think I'll be curious to start asking in those moments of myself, why am I annoyed right now that that just worked? Uh, um, yes. I'm also reaffirming that the core need that a lot of people have is the need to be heard and understood. And that no matter what they're complaining about, that there's that need underneath that. Like they might be complaining about a more superficial need. Superficial may not even be the right word, but a more obvious need that's stated at least. Visible, um, tactile maybe. Exactly. But underneath that, there's the need to be heard and understood. Do you know, so you know Maslow's hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, that the bottom of the pyramid is like food and shelter and, and stuff, right? And then at the very top, once all of these other needs have been met is self-actualization. Mm -hmm. He stole this from, I don't remember which tribe, but it's an indigenous tribe in North America. And their pyramid is exactly the, the opposite. Like the first thing in it is like connection and self-actualization and like, it's not exactly self-actualization. I'm paraphrasing. I'll find the real thing and put it in the, <laughs> the podcast. But yeah, he got, he flipped it exactly upside down. What? Yeah. Which is of course what white people do when we, we find a cool thing. It's like, Hey, how can we make the more capitalistic version of this? Because like the way the indigenous tribe had it totally subverts capitalism right well it's funny because that has never quite sat right with me like i can tell when i when my basic needs like when housing and food if i'm in survival mode about those things it is harder to focus on other stuff but that other stuff feels more important to me because i will actually put my housing at risk yep to go after my sense of purpose yes <laughs> like so that's never quite sat quite right for me so that is very interesting <laughs> Yeah, but like if if you tell people that your chief needs are like food and shelter and then you tell them that the only way to get that is to make money, like you you are brainwashing people into being like, "Oh, I have to work." And I have to work make, do a job that doesn't necessarily like like meet any deeper like personal need of mine. I I have to do a job that will make me money. Uh, Whereas like That's so maddening. It is. Like if, if you, if people knew, like, and were aware of, were present to like their greatest need was like honoring themselves and, and honoring their, their body and, and like kind of more spiritual needs, it's much harder to like, basically, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Capitalize on that? Yes. They're, yes. Yeah. You can't marshal <laughs> those people to like join a workforce because they're all like, yeah, but that thing isn't going to fulfill me. And this is what's. What I love about the conversations that are happening post pandemic is the number of executives and managers who are who are at a loss because their employees don't want to come back to the office. And p there's the great resignation, the number of people like millions of people are quitting their jobs. And um, a recent study just came out, I think it was about Generation Z, maybe it was millennials, people who are saying they would rather be unemployed and broke, then work a job that they hate. Me too. Same. Clearly. Uh-huh. Um, and it, I mean, of course, it's a very privileged thing to be able to do that. And not just like privileged financially, but for a, a lot of different ways. But like, still, like, there's an acknowledgement that this rat race. There's a diff mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't meeting something. There's something that it's not addressing that's more important. Yes. And it's just delightful. The the interviews that I'm seeing, the headlines that I'm seeing of executives and managers who are like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, they they can't like browbeat their employees into coming back to work. Even offering more money isn't enough incentive. And they're, <laughs> they're like, nothing works. Hmm. It reminds me of a book I read once called, uh, oh no, what was it called? 
something about dreams. The Dream Manager. It was a really great book. And the guy based it off a thing that he's been doing, which is literally like having organizations have a dream manager whose job is to find out what are people's dreams and then help them meet them. So he's like kind of part almost coach, part financial advisor. And it's like companies actually getting interested in the personal dreams of their employees and having that be part of what you do as a company is you invest your energy into helping people meet their dreams. Mm-hmm. And and the example he gave in the book, he, was, he kind of tells it as an allegory. Allegory? Is that the right word? The story he uses to kind of propose the idea is a company that's a um, like a janitorial company. So it's not like very rewarding, fulfilling work. Like, and there was people who were having a lot of turnover because it's not very rewarding, fulfilling work. But then adding this additional element of like, we actually care about you as a human and what you really want to do with your life. And and if that means you meet your dreams and you leave in two years, mm. like, okay. But you're here for two years in the meantime and not like three months because... <laughs> right. Or whatever. I don't know. It was a very interesting... Yeah, I think there's some interesting shifts coming down the pike. Yeah. Yeah, cuz I like I've been paying attention to the language that managers and executives use to manipulate employees into like, you know, be a team player and there's a great Reddit thread. I can't remember what it is, but it's it's people posting them telling off their bosses or, you know, quitting on the spot and and whatnot. And oh, everyone's dream. Yes, exactly. It's so it's so cathartic. Some manager had written in about like, so my employees, they come in and they do their job and then they leave and like their their commitment to the to the job doesn't continue when they go home. Like, how do I fix that? And- Why should they their home. Exactly. And everybody was just like, dude, you're paying them for a nine to five. And like, I don't want them to just like see it as a nine to five and clock out and just go home. Like I want their commitment to what we're doing to extend even beyond that. There's this weird, like, you know, we're your family and like you go above and beyond and be a team player and all of this messaging around you're not... It's not a family. Like your family can't fire you. Your boss can. There's all of these fake kind of comparisons and manipulative tactics to try to get people to put in more than what they're being paid for. I'm excited for you to read my friend's book, The New Stories of Love, Power, and Purpose. When's it getting published? The end of May, I think. Sometime in May. Because she talks about this exact thing like that. Because that's the problem. Like what they're saying is a manipulative tactic to try and get people to come to work distinct from an organization that actually doesn't have a power dynamic, like that has a distributed power dynamic. Like there's organizations out there that are driven by purpose, not by profit. Mm -hmm. And the people who work there are even being called purpose agents. And there's this interest in find, helping people identify their individual purpose and then have them work for organizations that align with their purpose which is more of a commitment. Like if my purpose is like peace on the planet, which is maybe cliche, but like if that was my purpose, for example, and I was working for an organization that that was their purpose, then my commitment would be broader than nine to five because there's this, and not in a like, I take my work home with me and I'm always thinking about work kind of a way, but more in that like my whole being is invested in this company or in the purpose of this organization. And I'm working with other people who are aligned with me and we're all working towards this purpose together, not just like this is work and I make a book and then I go like, it's a very different dynamic. And we all have our own autonomy and there's distributed power. And like, there isn't someone who can just fire me with like, all of that gets shifted. But if you're just saying, I'm your CEO and your boss, and I want to try and make you (laughs) care about this job. That's very different. Like the structure is not supportive of what you're out to create. Well, and especially given that like, you know, restaurants can play their employees like 250 an hour and rely on tips for the rest. Like why would you think that getting paid $2 and 50 cents an hour would have somebody want to do open and close and like work seven days a week? Like, yeah, it's just none of it matches how any of us actually. Yeah, it's wild. Um, I need to wrap up in a second because I got to go. Oh, yes. Plant trees. trees. Naturally, as you do. Thank you for chatting with me and being on my podcast. My first guest. Hooray. 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 Yeah, I was telling Anne earlier, our other sister, just I don't I'm, I'm open to being on podcasts. I just don't want to do the work of publishing a podcast. So thanks for having me as a guest. No, that's great. I'm, I'm delighted because I don't have a problem doing the work of running a podcast. Anyway. Okay, I love you. I'll talk to you later. Bye.
I love you too. Bye. Welcome back to the future. In light of what we were talking about, I wanted to mention one of my favorite tweets from one of my favorite Twitter handles. Uh, this is from Dr. Mona Masood, D-O, at Shrink Wrapping, S-H-R-I-N-K, Wrapping, on Twitter. God, that's such a good Twitter handle. So the tweet is, we often think productivity means to work. It doesn't. Productivity means to make intentional choices towards a goal. The choice could be to pause. The goal could be to replenish. Productivity could mean to rest. What's interesting is I realized I misremembered it. I thought it was making intentional progress towards a goal because my memory likes to squeeze in some capitalism in there on the sly. Uh, but no, it's intentional choices towards a goal. And that feels like a significant distinction. So I'm going to say it again because it's really good. We often think productivity means to work. It doesn't. Productivity means to make intentional choices towards a goal. The choice could be to pause. The goal could be to replenish. Productivity could mean to rest. Uh, additionally, in the section where we were talking about trauma drive, I mentioned that I didn't want to take breaks because I lose momentum. And I recently learned about this thing called autistic inertia, wherein, and I'm quoting here, autistic people tend to stay on one task unless stopped by a major outside force or tremendous act of will. <laughs> um, the link to the article that this quote is from is in the description. That may also be a contributing factor to why I just want to keep pushing through and not take breaks. Like it feels better in my body to keep pushing and stick with a thing until it's done. Also, a quick correction of myself. Towards the end there, I mentioned that I gaslight myself around being teachable because I have the judgment that I'm supposed to be open to suggestions. But that's not what gaslighting is. That's invalidation. I get annoyed when gaslit is used incorrectly, and so I wanted to correct that. Uh, gaslighting is intentionally undermining someone else's trust in themselves so that you can take advantage of them. Whereas invalidation is communicating to someone that their experience doesn't make sense. And that's it. So yes, that was invalidation, not gaslighting. Uh, I also wanted to mention a couple helpful references that uh, my sister and I brought up. Ruth mentioned a documentary about a farm and snails and ducks. That documentary is called The Biggest Little Farm, and I linked to the trailer in the description. She also mentioned a friend of hers had written a book called New Stories of Love, Power, and Purpose. The subtitle is A Global Invitation to Experiment with the Unknown, and the author is Christiane Seuss Scholler, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. So Christiane, if you're hearing this, I apologize. Uh, but yes, that's linked in the description as well. And the last thing I wanted to mention here is, let's talk about Maslow's hierarchy for a second. I mentioned that he stole it from a North American indigenous tribe, but didn't remember which one. Turns out it was the Blackfoot Nation, and it wasn't a pyramid that he stole. Their model wasn't a pyramid. It was a teepee. And in reference to the Blackfoot Nation's model, I said that if people were present to their greatest need of honoring themselves and honoring their body and their more spiritual needs, I was totally talking out of my ass there, making it hyper-individualistic, which is inaccurate to what the Blackfoot TP depicts. And this is what happens when I hear an idea, but don't do my due diligence and actually learn it fully. I know just enough to be dangerous. So Maslow didn't invert the Blackfoot TP so much as he, well, he did invert it and then he bastardized it and put in a bunch of other shit. Maslow's hierarchy starts with physiological needs at the bottom, so like food and water, and then safety needs like shelter and financial security, and then you have love and belonging, so like relationships and sex, and then you have esteem, which includes confidence, achievement, and respect, and finally self-actualization, which includes morality, creativity, acceptance, and lack of prejudice. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, you aren't able to not be prejudiced against people unless you are self-actualized. <sighs> There's just so much wrong here. The whole model centers the individual and the scope of the pyramid is a single person's lifespan. In contrast, the Blackfoot Nation's teepee 
starts at the bottom with self-actualization and then community actualization and finally cultural perpetuity, which is a much more expansive view of time and of actualization as a whole for that matter. It's not just about me. It's about community. It's about culture. And there's a great article about how Maslow spent time with the Blackfoot Nation and did a bunch of interviews and observations and then put it in the colonizing sausage making machine and spit out what colonizers always spit out. Appropriative capitalist white supremacist dogma. So yeah, I didn't think this was going to be the episode where I went full anti-capitalist on air, but uh, here we are. No time like the present. Last episode, I came out swinging against Western psychology and the DSM, so this episode, capitalism. Let's burn it all fucking down. Okay, I'm hopping off my soapbox, and I'm going to go to bed now. So thank you for joining us. And I can say us because you were joining me and my sister. And a big thank you to Ruth for taking the time to hop on the phone and talk all of this out seven months ago. And a huge thank you to Ruth for her patience while it took me all this time to finally get around to editing this episode and putting it up. So yes, thank you all. And I'm going to end this my normal way, which is to say I'm going to end it super abruptly. This has been Let's Therapize That Shit with your host, me, Joy Gerhard. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, subscribe, and tell your friends about it. I'll see you next time. Intro and outro music is Swan Lake Opus 20 by Tchaikovsky, performed by the London Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Anatoly Fistulari, and released on LP by Richmond High Fidelity London Records in 1952.